First, to sort of give you my journey as an entrepreneur, where I started and how I started, and how I got to where we are now. Uh, my first job was at Sikorsky Aircraft, just cost an analyst. I went to some IBM schools, they sent me there. Westinghouse uh, hired me to come over and help them build a system for the international company and the domestic company. And I spent five years back and forth to the Pan Am building and uh, in five years, we accomplished something that hasn't been, didn't happen. At that time, uh, systems were not the type of systems they are now. They are IBM, key punch cards, and you had to load them into the computer, and you had to wait for printouts. Anyway, so we, we accomplished that. And I remember the day that uh, we actually, the system went live, uh, everything worked, meaning domestic products were sent internationally, and everything was uh, computerized. And uh, they had a big uh, meeting at the uh, Biltmore Hotel. Don Burnham was the chairman. I remember these names today. Uh, Pepe de Kubis was the international president. Don uh, Noel, who was the uh, CFO. They all had the pointers out there, and they're presenting uh, how the pressure price would increase, mainly because of the efficiency of the system that we built, myself and 40 other programmers. I was the systems uh, supervisor. I had 40 programmers working for me. And it was a, uh, a day in which they had, you know, maybe a couple hundred uh, EVPs from around the world uh, applauding uh, this fact. One thing that did not happen to me that day was being recognized by the CEO, the chairman, either the chairman of the company, the chairman of the international company, or the CEO of, our, of my division, did not recognize me or the people within the uh, in the audience that did it. And as of that day, I said to myself, I'm out of corporate America. I left, I went to my, uh, I went to my uh, chief report and I said to him, Mr. Buck, I said, I'm leaving as of today, but like two days later. He said, Bill, he said, sure, you know, you could actually be a, uh, you know, you could be like an executive vice president of this company when you're 50. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I was 25 then. I said, you know, as of tomorrow, I'll be the president of my own company. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, I can't, I can't agree with that. So, okay, so one thing, I, one thing that I remembered from that was that in order for you to make it, you have to have people who you recognize and people, everybody's connected. There's not really one person who's not connected to another person. So I said to myself, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to make sure at least the people that are working for me are going to get enough recognition for the work that they have done. So I decided, well, what am I going to do? My father was a small, uh, small town uh, uh, mason contractor. I remember going to the house and said, well, maybe I'll get into the real estate business. So as I'm going back and forth to New York thinking about what I wanted to do, I looked at the Fortune uh, Forbes 100, uh, wealthiest people in the world, and it was 90% of more real estate. So I said, well, why don't I get into the real estate business? So I did. So I left corporate America, opened a, uh, an office above a grocery store myself, in fact, myself, a phone in the desk, and didn't know what to do, didn't know how to do real estate. So I went to the library looking for, well, how do you run a real estate company? What forms do you use? So I went in there and I got the forms, I sent away from the forms, and, and I made my, our first deal, I made it, I had this little form that I got from the, uh, from the, uh, from the uh, catalog and I handed it to the guy who was, who was the co -pro, and he said, what's this? I said, well, isn't this what you're supposed to use? He said, oh no, we have our own form. So anyway, so I, <laughs> so I did that. Well, one of the more interesting thing, I said, I'm going through the business, we have like a, three or four, five, six people now that I've hired, I brought the grocery store, uh, the real estate industry started to take notes that we're doing pretty well. And I remember I got, I got a phone call from sort of the chief guy uh, in town, and he said to me, so I'll have lunch with you. And I said, wow, isn't that cool? That's really this big sharp real estate guy is recognizing us and wants to have me and have lunch with him and mm -hmm. other fellow realtors in town. So I said, great. So he picks me up, and we go to the high hope. 
And in Iowa, there's everybody in town who owns the companies in there. So it's sort of like I was going to Tony Soprano in the uh, market. <laughs> so he said, come on, sit down. And after lunch, they said to me, you know, young man, you know, you're doing a nice job here, but you're not doing the kind of job that we think you should be doing. And I said, so, what do you mean by that? He said, you know, you know we charge 6% commissions. We co-broke at a certain rate. We charge referrals at, at uh, 30%. What I was doing is I was changing all the numbers. I would not co-broke at the numbers that they were doing. I was not charging the referrals that were coming in, uh, referrals come from New York coming in. They were giving 30%, I was giving 40%. To co so I changed the rules a bit, and as a result, business started to come my way. And they said, well, you know, if you don't live by what we suggest you do, we'll run you out of town. <laughs> and so I went for a Jeez, wow. <laughs> so I went home, I said to my wife at the time, I said, you know, I think uh, I'll have to look at it if I'm going to eat the car every morning because I think, guys <laughs> <laughs> I think these guys are pretty mad at me. So uh, I did not listen. I said, well, I stood up in the meeting at the time, I stood up in the meeting at the time, and I said, you know what? Uh, Last time I remember, this was America. You could do what you wanted to do. I mean, what rules? Who, who set these rules up that I have to follow? And I said, I'm just not going to follow those rules. So I said, I'll do what I have to do, and you guys have to do what you have to do. So that was it. And uh, none of them are in business today. <laughs> One of the things I did find out during the, during the couple things I found out. One is you have to be honest with yourself and the people you're dealing with in regard to what you owe and what you don't owe, and you really, you really can't play any games. So what we did was, uh, I said to myself, what's the unique thing that we have as a company that other real estate companies do not have? And the unique thing that we have that is uh, different than our competitors is the public is usually perceived as the customer of the real estate agent and of the company. We've reversed that a little bit. Our agent is our customer. Thinking they have more business than I get through a phone call, they have multiple businesses and multiple relationships. So my job is to build their business and to help them become successful with their customers. I have to sure give a third front for all customers, but my difference is making sure that they're successful. So at the end of the day, What's our business model and what's the difference? Basically, everybody's connected. There's no one person who's really important. Everybody's connected. And without the people who work for you, you have nothing. You basically have furniture. So the most important thing we did was recognize my Westinghouse days, not being recognized, basically was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because it's a whole foundation of how I built my business. You know, and the most important asset we all have is our time. And uh, you're here today, right? You're taking up your time. Time is money, okay? So what I'm going to try to do is just give you three I, the three themes that I relied on to develop the business I developed. And, uh, you know, the first one um, is compassion. You know, how do you develop compassion? Now, I had a problem is I couldn't read. I graduated high school on a fourth grade reading level. Um, I would look in a dictionary one day and I asked my father what the end meant at the end of a word because I didn't know what it meant a noun. And so I, I was pushed through school because I was such a problem. And I had a speech impediment. I, I, had a, a, I was always anxious. I was always moving around, uh, dyslexic. I put numbers backwards and everything. So I was really not very good in school at all. So the thing that really had a big impression on me is, is a book called The Family of Man, because it, is, it was pictures, it was 580 pictures of, uh, of uh, different people around the world. And because I couldn't read, this book had a great influence on my desire to, you know, to become a compassionate person. Because what I did is I went and I bought a camera I bought the first single reflex camera in 1965, 66, 
and I kept it in my plumbing truck. And wherever I went in Bridgeport, I would take my camera and I would take pictures of people, you know? And I think that discipline of working through the camera lens, looking for people or their problems, their happiness, I really developed my compassion by taking those pictures. The other thing that really helped me, you know, was really my father. My, my, you know, you know, you don't pick your father, you don't pick your mother. You're stuck, you know, one way or another, okay? okay? You know, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, but my father was just a very compassionate person. Uh, and the story that he told me that I always carried out throughout my life is that he was working in Tennessee as a plumber during World War II. He was working on the plant where they were building the nuclear energy in Tennessee. He was a plumber. Um, and every day they would take a bus that went for about five miles out to where the factory is and then five miles back. Okay? And, and one day um, uh, they were coming back, you know, it's the end of the day, it was August, and a, and a black man went to get on the bus and some white guy from Tennessee kicked him off the bus. He says, you walk. Okay? And my father says that, had, that put such a pit in his stomach that he couldn't eat that day and he never got that feeling out of him. And I always have this image of my dad um, uh, uh, in a bus, a, a handsome black hair, driving a school bus with a dust and a black man standing there having to walk five miles. Okay? So, th so that little story had a tremendous input, input on, on me. Uh, but most of the things that I learned, I learned as a plumber. And I built my business from being a plumber. Um, service is the First you have compassion, then you have to understand service, okay? What it means to service other people. And I, I really learned that at Mrs. Monroe's house. Mrs. Monroe was a, a mother that was on welfare in Bridgeport. And uh, I always remember going to the house. It was a gray house. It had a black door, a screen door, and uh, no, uh, uh, no glass in the screen door. I knocked on the door, Mrs. Monroe opened the door, and she had three beautiful little boys, uh, all in white little shorts, and they were crying their eyes out because they couldn't use the bathroom. They couldn't use the toilet bowl, okay? So I, 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 I went there, and I'm cleaning out the toilet bowl, like, you know, like this, a bit with an auger, and as I'm doing it, Mrs. Monroe is hanging on my arm, saying, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you. <laughs> and I'm looking at her as he holds that. But she was so grateful that I would go there and clean out her tar bowl so her kids can use uh, the bathroom. And I realized at that moment that uh, being of service to others is really the number one, one of your number one columns in building any business. You're there to service other people. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I always remember Mrs. Monroe because that's where the seed was planted, that you can have a very wonderful, successful life if you're dedicated to service of other people. 1990, worst year of my life. 1990, I woke up one day, and I owed the bank 62 and a half million personally. I owed vendors about seven million, like plumbers and carpenters and, and lawyers and, and architects. Uh, I had 365,000 square feet of empty space. And my real estate, and I was, I was losing 500,000 a month in cash, and my real estate was 50% underwater. In other words, if I owed uh, 10 million on a building, it wasn't worth 5 million. So that's the hole I was in. <coughs> and I, I like to say that there's only two things that God doesn't know. God doesn't know what Jesuits are thinking or how I got out of that hole in 1990. <laughs> also as a plumber, so we have compassion, we have service, and also as a plumber, I was called out to replace a boiler um, in, in East Main Street, and it was an October day, and, the, uh, and, and, and it used to be a time where what these people used to do is they used to take coal fire boilers and put an oil burner in it, okay? And um, so it was leaking, and I told the lady I had to replace it, and so, she's, so uh, she says, can you do it? I said, yes, I can do it right now for you. And I went around and I counted the radiators, because if you count the radiators, the height of the radiators, you know how much heat you have to buy. 
So I, I would call Lipnick Plumbing Supply, Murray Lipnick, and I said, Murray, uh, please come out and, um, and send someone after lunch and bring a boiler, 300,000 BTUs, whatever it was. And I went down there and I took out the boiler by myself. And the way I did it was I, I took two hammers, and if you, if you hit the fitting at the same time, two five-pound hammers, the fitting would pop so you could save the, the threads. You could make the job easier for yourself. I broke up the whole boiler, uh, got a garbage can, took everything out. There was that much black coal on the boiler. So I got it all done by lunch, and I'm sitting on the steps looking down into the, the, into the basement. Now, you, you imagine... You know, the, the, those doors that open up where you used to walk down in the basement, so you got that image. And I was sitting there, and every day I had the same sandwich. I had uh, two peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, an apple, and a thermos of cold water. I mean, I, I only made ninety-three fifty a week working for my father for five years. So I never had, you know, I never had any money when I was growing up. And as I was eating the sandwich, I had to take the wax paper, I had to take it with my teeth, and open up the wax because my hands, I was so black, my hands, I didn't want to touch the food. As I, as, as I was sitting there, the sweat was just pouring off my face and onto my arms, and you could see the sweat running down like a zebra looking, okay? That's what I looked at. And I looked down into that furnace, into that basement, and I said, I've got to use my imagination. I've got to do something different with my life, okay? I can't do this any longer. Okay? I got to do something different. You know, and that's a key item in a business career, your imagination. You know? And with your imagination, you can image yourself as a better person, become a better person, a better father, become a better father. You know, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas says, see what you are, become what you see. See what you are, become what you see. He means by that is that you are in the image of Christ, become Christ-like. Do Christ-like work. Be a good person. Image yourself as a good person. In the real estate business, you really have to really think on your feet, you know? And you have to know the five F's in business, the five F's, you know? You've got to have fun, you've got to be friendly, you've got to be fast, you've got to be focused, and you've got to be flexible. Those are your five F's, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you.